good morning. Good morning, students. All right. A uh, couple announcements before we begin regular lecture. I have a grade memoranda uh, for a bunch of student athletes filled out. So if that's you, if you're here today, uh, come up and get yours. They're ready. A couple other things. Oh, uh, somebody was asking me about the picture, the, the background. Uh, let's see if I can. And uh, on this slide, I'd like to point out something. That, uh, Albert Einstein, he's the quotation of the day for this, for this month of October. Uh, he was kind of a wiseacre. And so this particular comment. Okay, so let's let's um, take some examples, uh, and I just dreamed up these numbers. Uh, they're fairly realistic. Uh, running back is faster than the DB. Uh, running back is running to the right at 8.3 meters per second. Here are my dots over here to the to the right side of the screen. These are the initial conditions. I big letter I there so you don't miss it and the DB is running leftward at 7.8 meters per second now there are two masses uh, I just decided all right these are typical masses for a couple you know, for a running back maybe a little smaller than the DB DB being a little bit bigger maybe it's just like a safety maybe And so in the tackling interaction, the uh, defensive back tackles the running back and holds on. So what that means is that your final condition, after interaction, you're going to have one big dot. Because just like with the box cars that latch together, you get one big object. Uh, moving off at one particular velocity. Same thing here. But what we want to know is, uh, and which we can figure out, is, um, you know, who's going to win. Now, the combination, the fourth column here is the combination specs for the uh, DB and the running back after they tackle. So their mass is 163 kilograms. And, but what we don't know yet is whether the running back wins and goes on to add a few, a few more yards or if the DB wins and puts the running back on as you know what, which is what he's supposed to do. All right, so we don't know if, he's, if, the, if the net momentum, well, we don't know it yet, but we're going to. Um, we don't know which way it's going, but the the tail of the winner is told by the momenta, specifically by the total momentum. If it is negatory, that means the DB wins. If it is positive, that means the running back wins, and the running back gets a few more yards. Otherwise, if it's negative, the de defensive back wins and knocks the uh, running back down, and, and, the, and then the refs go, Poof. they whistle to play dead, and, and then they play over again. So now... We want, so in order to, to determine this interaction, it's not the speeds, it's not the mass. Now notice here that, uh, that one guy's got more mass and one guy's got more speed. But it's not speed only. It's not mass only. 
It's the combination of mass with speed, the product thereof, the momentum that tells the tale. So first one, initial momentum for the running back, 8.3 times 77. Get your calculator out and verify me. Don't let me catch you napping. And don't. Don't let me be caught napping. Don't, don't let me nap. If I make a mistake you, and you're verifying as we go, you'll be able to say, Dr. B, you're napping. Okay, so I'm trying to avoid that, and I want you to try to avoid that too. Okay, uh, DB, Mr. 29, trying to tackle this guy. Negative 7.8 meters per second of velocity, 86 kilograms of mass. And so that means his momentum is negative 670.8. All right, just multiply those two numbers out. And this is a fairly simple interaction. Now, to get the total momentum, you have to have minus signs. You have to do it carefully, and we've done it carefully. Minus sign signifies leftward. So if you just add these two momenta, the running back initial momentum, the defensive back initial momentum, uh, you get uh, negative 31.7 kilograms. So now you know who wins. Because afterwards, after the interaction, supposedly uh, the momentum, the final momentum of the system the DBRB combo, that big dot, is going to be negative 31.7 as well. So that tells the tale. You now know who wins, the defensive back. He tackles the, the running back, and that ends the play. Now, if you, in addition, want to figure out the final velocity state, not a problem. All you do is use the uh, definition of moment momentum, P equals MV. And hey, the thing about it is you're using a different M here. So that negative 31.7 kilogram meters per second is MV, but for this M, for 163 kilograms. Because right after impact, you know, there's still... You know, when they hit the ground, they're going to, you know, let go of each other. You know, when the, the play is whistled dead. But until that whistle goes, he's going to try to keep a lock on the, on the running back. And the mass is going to be under 63 kilograms. So uh, if you do that, negative uh, 31.7 kilogram meters per second divided by 163 is negative 0.19 meters per second. Now, I'm going to give you a clicker question here in just a second, but before I do, let me pause for questions. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, we're going to do another example, so turn on your clicker. And this is going to be a numeric question, very similar, uh, but a different wide receiver and a different tackler, a, a linebacker. Is this a cool picture or what? I think that's like Ray Lewis uh, cleaning the clock of somebody on the Broncos. Anyway, uh, ignore the picture and just do the numbers and calculate the total momentum of the wide receiver linebacker system, just like we just did for the wide res for the running back and the defensive back. Okay, and I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And remember, as always, uh, definitely interact with your neighbor who is sitting next to you. If no one's sitting next to you, Use your pure mental brain power.
did you see the, did you see the stuff that was in the envelope you can open it later Now this is not Demarius Thomas. He's number 88 for the Broncos right now. So this has got to be a couple years ago. Who was that guy? A really tall... S Notice where the ball is in this photograph. The ball is going bye-bye. Incomplete pass. This is what you call being depleted. This is great. I love to see you guys working. Thirty seconds. Have you guys got your answers in? Really? Okay, good. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, let's see what you guys got. Wow. Wow. We got some brainiacs in here. It's good. Uh, okay, uh, the answer is 22, positive. Uh, okay, wide receiver momentum. His mass, 88 kilograms times speed, 19 meters per second at 1,672. It's positive, so in other words, rightward. The uh, momentum of the linebacker before interaction is negative 1650 negative sign to indicate leftward and so just add them up uh, 1672 plus a negative 1650 is plain old positive 22 so uh, the wide receiver wins in this particular interaction just barely so he might get another 
you know, a few inches of yardage, but but he did win in this interaction. So you can write down the 88 wins. Now, you can expect to see problems like that on homework 11 tonight. I'll try to try to get uh, something really good and, and uh, juicy on there for you. And uh, definitely on the next exam. So Now, I want to talk about another concept with you called energy. And let me break this back down to presentation mode. Uh, don't keep don't put your clicker away we got another clicker question coming up if you look at this picture you know I always ask the question what does the observer see what are you looking at huh it looks like Tour de France I'm not sure if it is Tour de France but it's one of those big road races, bicycling road races over in Europe, probably going up the Alps or the Pyrenees somewhere, uh, maybe somewhere else. And notice that they're heading uphill, and these guys are closer. These guys are closer, but you can see that there's a big hill between them. So these guys are gaining elevation, all right? And... What I was, you know, when I see a picture like this, I always wonder, now what if this guy blows his, t has a flat tire and spills his bike? Everybody that's the end of the race for that day. And that happens too. You can see it, you know, on the blooper reels and stuff. And then you got these chase cars. These are their coaches and stuff with water and whatnot, extra tires. I don't know. But anybody ever here been in, a, in one of these type of road races on bike? Have you? It's pretty brutal, I bet. Man. Of course, here in Florida, there's no mountains, but it go just about anywhere else, you can... Yeah, I bet. Yeah, you get some real good... So you're going uphill. Start taking notes. Energy notes. You're going uphill. Now, how do you get yourself... You're on a bike. You're going uphill. How do you get yourself going uphill? Well... If you're going to try to go uphill, you got to use your muscles, your muscles. You know, the two biggest ones in your uh, body are your quadriceps muscles. For most people, that's your biggest. And how do those get any kind of action? Well, you got to eat some food. So you got to do your carbo loading or you got to eat some beef jerky or pizza or whatever it is you eat before the race you got to eat something because you're going to be burning a lot of calories and you're going to be expending a lot of energy and where does that food come from well it comes from animals and plants all right so you want to go uphill it's because animals and plants provide food but you know the animals and the plants they're just they're not just out there whistling dixie contributing free energy to the food chain they get all their energy from plants at the bottom of the food chain through photosynthesis okay and photosynthesis uh is a chemical process in a plant most plants in which uh sunlight is transformed into carbohydrates basically so photons of sunlight so the sun you know photosynthesis won't happen in the dark so you got to have photons of sunlight burning across you know 93 million miles of space 500 light seconds did you know that it takes 500 seconds for light to go from the sun to to our planet 500 499 point something so I was rounded off to 500. So, yeah, photons of sunlight. And where do they come from? Well, you know, is, is, that, is that what the sun is? It's just a big ball of photons? And, oh, it is not. The sun, like that picture from Cadillac Mountain, is a big ball of hydrogen at the center of which 
Nuclear fusion reactions occur spontaneously. That is what a star is. It is a blob of hydrogen that kind of accumulated and formed from the smithereens and debris of exploding supernovas, usually, and starts a nuclear fusion reaction. So you could say, if you wanted to, to that your bicycle is nuclear powered because it all traces back to nuclear fusion in the SUN. And that is one way to think about energy. The way that we're going to think about energy uh, is the following, that Energy is another dynamical quantity. It's like the partner of momentum. And energy specifically encodes changing speed. Now, momentum encodes changing direction, changing velocity. Energy encodes changing speed. And what we're going to try to figure out is how that actually works. Okay. So... Um, and this is just a picture of a tank using a little bit of energy to get from point A to point B. Uh, somewhere in France during World War II. It's kind of a cool photo. Uh, here's a picture of my weed whacker at home on my workbench. Uh, four cycle engine, 29 cc. Um, not a whole lot of horsepower, but just enough to run that thing. And what we're going to do now is we're going to consider the path of an object, you know, not a weed whacker, but, you know, maybe something going around a track. And what we're going to do is ask this particular question. Is the force tangent to the path? If there's a force, does it have any newtons parallel to the path, tangent to the path? Because if it does, then it's parallel to the velocity and that force will change the speed. If it's anti-parallel, it, in other words, the opposite direction, um, so velocity to the left, force to the right, for instance, that's anti-parallel. Uh, it will also change the speed. It'll slow it down. Right? And that's kind of what we're after here. Now, the side question that accompanies that is, is you know, if you're on a path and you're experiencing a force, are any of the newtons perpendicular to the path? Because that's a um, a definite, you know, possibility. Uh, and every curved path we know has to have some newtons uh, perpendicular to the path because those are centripetal newtons. So the centripetal newtons, however, do not change the speed. Only the uh, uh, the newtons that are tangent to the path parallel to the velocity or anti-parallel to the velocity okay now on a perfectly circular path uh, you may have some if it's if it's a perfectly circular path uniform speed uniform circular motion uh, then you don't have any uh, tangent Newtons tangent to the path all right and so every path can be measured out in segments either by using a clock or by using a meter stick. And our increment, and we've already done that. For a, for a free fall trajectory of a basketball, we measured out increments uh, using stroboscopic principles. You know, every quarter of a second. We flashed the, the, the light, captured the image, and then measured. Now, you can do the same thing with meter sticks. Okay, measure out your trajectory, you know, so many meters or so many centimeters, so many light years, if you're really big distance, you're working with really big distances, all right? And so what we're going to do is compare these two, two things, and we, we've actually already done it for free fall uh, incremented by time. So let's look at that one again, and then we'll extend that to uh, free fall uh, incremented by spatial segments and hey you guys uh, th at th the very last item 2d ooh that should be 2b uh, my mistake anyways 2d on the screen 
it says by meter stick delta s uh, delta s is what I use to make uh, reference to any generic spatial um, direction so it you know delta s is completely generic I could use it to represent a delta x I could use it to you know so left or right I could use it to represent a delta y or I could use it to represent a delta z so uh, it's just kind of a generic notation all right free fall trajectory incremented by time we have done this here's a fairly now this one is not to scale all right the basketball is a little bit bigger than it should be to the scale uh, but for every del so this is like a strobe photo and for every one second of free fall you get a certain amount of delta P and so delta P is your dynamical quantity and actually delta T is a geometrical quantity and when I say that I'm talking about geometry in the sense that Albert Einstein talked about geometry for him the universe is a four-dimensional space-time time being the fourth dimension so x axis y axis z axis and Einstein taught us how to use the time axis uh, which we can't really see we don't have a meter stick but we do have clocks so we can we can grapple it if we do it carefully anyways so here are my uh, quantities and this is what I call a temporal partition of that free fall path now we're going to do another path over here on the right and this one is going to be partitioned out in free fall distances every 18 meters of drop distance so my delta y is negative all right and this is like having not a strobe photo but a trip wire every time and i i drop the ball and i set up a trip wire at negative 18 meters elevation and it flashes the camera and there's the image and then I I set up another trip wire at negative 36 meters flashes the camera there's the image and then maybe another one down here at negative 54 meters trip wire the basketball hits the trip wire or if it was like uh, Austin Powers movie you know there'd be lasers you know to trip you know not a trip wire but a, a laser to to show that the the balls pass through the the position negative 54 meters all right so here's my geometric quantity delta y you know time is the a four dimensional geometry quantity uh, and delta y is part of the four dimensional space time and it's a geometrical quantity now this is my spatial partition over here so my delta s is no longer generic it's a delta y okay and so the question is um, naturally speaking all right if I have equal geometric increments and equal dynamic increment called momentum is it possible that there's some other dynamical quantity that goes in equal size bytes for a spatial partition in other words is there a dynamical quantity that has equal uh, increments on this partition of the path totally different accounting scheme we're using lasers instead of a strobe we're a, a set of laser trip wires all right so in this example of the falling basketball you know we've got these partitions and here's our question is there some quantity u you know capital u for unknown that you get equal increments of it on this path on the spatial partition it worked okay for temporal partition you know we got equal delta p's what do we get over here for equal delta y's do we get something else that uh, partitions equally and of course 
secretly, hopefully, you know that the answer to that is a rhetorical question, and you know that the answer to it is Y E S. The answer is yes, um, and the and the quantity is energy. So uh, let's go back to the um, generic curve. Um, and let's do another another analogy. You know, we use the analogy of the the temporal partition, and we we paralleled it up. We we analogized it up with a spatial partition. All right. So we have a a, a force law called F equals m a, a version of which is the impulse equation delta p equals F net delta t. All right, and delta p is the thing on a temporal partition that you get equal bite-sized pieces of. All right, so delta u, what is it f net times delta s? You know, for some increment, spatial increment delta s. If it, I mean, that would be, you know, that would be your leading question. That would be a conjecture. Okay, delta p, f net, delta t works on a temporal partition. What works on a spatial partition? It should be something like this. Delta U is the equal size bytes of a force times a distance. And just as a side note, as I mentioned before, delta X could represent any increment of the path. And it could be, you know, a delta X, a delta Y, delta Z, or even a delta R for radial motion. You know, like a rocket going straight up from the Earth uh, you could, you know, from any point on Earth, if it's going straight up, you can represent that, that as delta R for the radial coordinate. So here's our, here's our conjecture here, that whatever U is, it's going to be a force times some equal size byte of partitioned path. Now, we had a free fall path that, you know, we used delta Y, uh, 18 meters negative, uh, but it could be any other path. So let's look at a generic path, All right? So go ahead and draw yourself a generic path, uh, G, and trace in a good tangential velocity. Go ahead and put yourself a dot somewhere down here. It could be anywhere. And just lightly trace in a velocity vector. And if if this thing is going to change the speed, we have to have some newtons of force parallel to that velocity. All right? So you might have something perpendicular, uh, or you might have something parallel. Now, this net force, straight to the right, is a combination of both. All right? So this represents a force of like a Maserati going through the curves and accelerating as it does. Because this force, this blue and red arrow, this net force, uh, has got some Newtons toward the inside of the turn. And it's also got some Newtons parallel to the velocity. So it's gaining speed and it's turning. Okay, so this is somebody accelerating through the turn, you know, which you can do. Right, so so here's my here's my diagram. Now let's keep going. What we want to do f to figure out this analogy here, d this is my analogy here, delta U equals F net times delta S. That's my guess. I'm not done with it. And what I think I should do now is refine it so that it's not just the net force, it's the parallel component uh, of the net force that is parallel to the path. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you blow up the net force, okay, then there's going to be some Newtons parallel to the velocity. Okay, now watch what I do here, okay? Don't sketch it in yet. Just kind of eyeball what I'm doing. It's all animated, okay? So there's my net force. I blew it up a little bit bigger, so that's a copy and a dilation. Okay, and this this vector f parallel here is parallel to this red velocity vector over here. 
Okay, so now try to trace it in. Okay, so here's my straight horizontal to the right net force. And some of the Newtons are going to be in this direction. So this one, I've got some F parallel Newtons in that direction. Now the other thing that I've got are some Newtons perpendicular to the path. So here are my centripetal Newtons, F perpendicular. So that one has uh, the little perpendicularity symbol. <coughs> Excuse me. Whoa. I wonder if that's going to be on the podcast transcript. All right, so we're going to so we're going to work with this one. For our analogy delta u, we're going to use f parallel. Now, f perpendicular is over here. That's the centripetal force, but it's not going to be changing the speed. The only one that changes the speed in which is what I'm interested in for delta u is f parallel. All right. Now, they they form a right triangle, so try to sketch in this right triangle carefully. All right. And then let me let me move it back. So here's here's what it I'm going to move it back so that everything's tail to tail. All right, here it is again. Okay. So there's there's F parallel. Okay, and here's the here's the tires, here's the force, F net, is the force from the road uh, on the Maserati that pushes the Maserati toward the center of the turn and accelerates it down the track at a higher speed. Okay, so here it is again. All right, so there's your right triangle. Okay, so try to sketch that in. So F perpendicular and F parallel, even though they're kind of oriented at some random angle, I didn't really measure the angle, they're perpendicular and they do form the sides of a right triangle. The hypotenuse of that right triangle is the net force. Let me repeat that. F perpendicular and F parallel form perpendicular sides of a right triangle. The hypotenuse of the right triangle is F net. And you can always do this. It might you know, it might be that your your F net is straight down and then you don't, you know, you don't have to worry about anything else. You know, it's just, you know, for the basketball going straight down, that's parallel to the path. The path is straight down. The weight force is straight down. Nice. Okay, so you don't have to worry about it. So it just depends on the path and the force. They are independent. All right. So now I'm going to paste my... F parallel up here and just kind of lightly trace it and push it out to the side just a little bit so you can distinguish the velocity vector and the F parallel vector. All right. And I've made mine the right size for this original version of the net force. All right. So, so down here, this is the portion of F net that changes the speed. And that's really what we're driving at here. You know, the other portion, the centripetal portion, F perpendicular changes the direction as you go through the turns. So you would always have some F perpendicular if you're driving on a curved track, even if you never change the speed. If you're on cruise control on a curved track, uh, you're going to have some F perpendicular. And if you're on cruise control, you're never going to have any F parallel. Think of it that way. Let me, re let me repeat that sentence. If you're on a curved track and you're on cruise control, you're never going to have any F parallel. The only force that you'll have on your car is F perpendicular, the centripetal forces, because your speed is set by cruise control. All right. Now, clicker time. Hit the refresh key. Turn it back on and hit refresh. Because the next question is multiple choice. All right, so here it comes. The parallel component of the net force. All right, so this this slide just basically is 
shows you a recap of everything we were doing on the previous few slides. So make a decision and talk it over with your neighbor. Thirty seconds. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Na na na. Na na na. Ten seconds. Eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one, zero. 290 students just clicked in an answer. Let's see if your brains are. Uh, okay, we got some explaining to do here. Uh, a number of you voted for slows down. That is incorrect. The perpendicular component, if you voted for that uh, option A, um, let me put this back over here. This is the correct answer. It changes, F perpendicular changes the direction. If it's perpendicular to the velocity, it's not really working with the velocity to speed it up or against it to slow it down. It's just perpendicular. It's neither with nor against. All right? So it's just going to change the direction. So make sure you keep that in mind when you're studying these things. All right, now let's get back to this analogy. Okay, and let me get this slide back over here. Okay. So our new dynamical quantity is going to be, and we're going to use the symbol W for work. It's going to be F parallel times an increment of the path. It is oriented to the path. It is defined in relation to the path, just as F perpendicular is defined in relation to the path. So whatever your path is, look for newtons that are tangent to the path, tangent, parallel to the velocity, and that will be your F parallel. And from that, you form this dynamical quantity that comes in equal partitions uh, on the spatial partition. Right. So um, now let's go back to my spatial partition. Right. Here's the vertical path. The dynamical quantity is F parallel times, in this case, delta Y. All right? And believe it or not, if you do a little bit of calculus, uh, not a whole lot, but a little bit, uh, raise your hand if you've had a calculus class. And I know there's a bunch of you that have. Um, the conserved quantity, uh, the work, or the dynamical quantity that comes in equal size bytes, bite sized pieces involves V squared, not V. And so after you uh, do the calculus, you get this quantity, one half M V squared. Now, if you have had calculus, you might be able to see uh, an integral by looking at that formula. The derivative of this looks like something else that we've been talking about. But if you haven't had calculus, uh, as the Terminator says, trust me. Come with me if you want to live. This is the kinetic energy formula. All right. And delta and kinetic energy is what increments uh, equally with equal drop increments. One half mv squared. So it's it's the one half mv squared that comes in bite-sized pieces on the spatial partition. 
Now we used spatial partition of negative 18 meters. If you use one centimeter, you know, delta Y is one centimeter, you get equal bite sized chunks of one half MB squared. It, it won't be very big, but they'll all be equal, centimeter by centimeter. So, so another way of saying this is that a force like gravity on the surface of the Earth, good old W equals mg. Oh, by the way, students, capital W, we now have two things that use that symbol, work and weight. Weight force, W equals mg. Work, W equals change in kinetic energy, delta Ke. Um, so be aware of the context. Read carefully, as always, and be aware of that context, and don't get tripped up. Um, so delta Ke, the work, is equal to F parallel times delta Y in this particular case. All right? And so we've now established an analogy for the spatial partition. So, hey, you guys, we're now not just in the school of Galileo, but we're now in the College of Einstein because we're thinking four dimensionally you know so you could tell your parents or your you could tell an engineering student that's annoying uh, yeah we were we were thought, talking of four dimensions today God, it's squared away what's the problem you know and tell your parents yeah we were talking about four dimensions today and force and and, and we got it all squared away here it is here's the summary all right we have geometric quantities. I mean, if we're talking space-time, four-dimensional space-time, time is one of the geometric quantities. That's what Sir, Sir Isaac, uh, Sir Albert, sorry, Professor Albert Einstein, that's what he said. He said that, uh, yeah, time's the fourth dimension. All right, so here's one of them over here. Here's one. Here's the fourth dimension, and delta y. That's like the second dimension. You know, x, y, z, and time. Okay, so here's two of them. And the dynamical quantities. So this is not stuff that you measure with meter sticks or clocks. This is a combination of meter sticks, clocks, and balance measurements. It's a dynamical quantity. Uh, mv, momentum comes in bite-sized chunks. One-half mv squared comes in bite-sized chunks on this kind of partition. And so, uh, by the way, uh, one-half mv squared, a kilogram times the square of a speed, is um, one kilogram meter squared per second squared in the metric system. Uh, that's a joule. And this unit does have a fancy name. It's named after a guy, an English guy named Joule, J-O-U-L-E. And we'll probably talk about him next week a little bit. Today's Thursday, right? And uh, also, as a side note here, let me also uh, tell you that sometimes uh, when you're working on a calculation, it's sometimes nice to express the um, the energy, you know, your delta Ke or whatever energy you're working with, as um, a certain number, you know, 22.3 newton meters. So Nm, newton meter, is the same as a joule, and it is the same as a kilogram meter squared per second squared, right? And when we work out examples of this on homework, and in lecture next week, uh, you'll see how sometimes it's nice to have newton meters, sometimes it's nice to just have joules, and sometimes it's nice to use kilogram meter squared per second squared because then you can cancel nicely and stuff like that. Um, is anybody up for dismissal early today? All right. Homework 11 will be available by lunchtime tomorrow. Due next Tuesday. You're dismissed. 
1137.